this is a grand place to be speaking about um, ordinariness. Though, of course, such an imposing building is made of the most ordinary of materials, stone and sand mixed with water. You see, I'm here today to suggest something to you. I'm here to advocate being ordinary, true ordinary, not the fake kind, the true kind. Now, by true ordinary, I don't mean dull. I don't mean lacking get up and go. I certainly don't mean being unintelligent. Nor do I mean being unwilling to improve yourself or denying yourself an appreciation of the extraordinary in life. I mean being the human equivalent of stone and sand mixed with water. I mean being plain in your tastes, modest in your appetites, and above all, humble in your expectations. I mean making a solid foundation of yourself and of being healthily socialized too, and that's a given if you're true ordinary. See, I think we, the fortunate children of prosperous Australia, live so pressured into arrogance and vanity by our popular culture and our ambitious and competitive peers that we're in danger of having the true ordinary squeezed out of our culture. There are, in any one day, a thousand media voices bombarding us with examples of how to exist in this world as a prettily preened consumer, knowing our fashion labels and our real estate prices as if they were scripture. We're subjected to prissy media commentators telling us what is appropriate or inappropriate, and how we should behave, and how we should think as if we're in some factory for the production of perfect, flawless people. We give ourselves airs that we're cultured because we can eat and perhaps can cook fancy cuisine instead of being thankful for anything that's put in front of us. I used to think the biggest treat you could have was a pikelet with heaps of butter on it. Do you remember pikelets? Yeah. Yeah. They seem pretty low rent these days, <laughs> but I still love them. My late auntie Doris, she made great pikelets. She was a cleaner. She cleaned public toilets for a living. Not a pretty job, you'd have to say, but she never complained. She didn't like people who complained. To her, people who complained were up themselves. Now, auntie Doris didn't have much money. But when I was a boy, she always gave me $5 for my birthday. Every year, she'd say to me, it's just a small token. Well, here's a word of advice. If someone who doesn't have much in this world ever gives you a gift and says, it's just a small token, that's a sign that they're true ordinary. Take them to your heart and keep them there. You can trust them. They'll never let you down. Now, a lot of people I know have their favorite restaurants where the price of the entree alone would feed a destitute family in the sedan for God knows how long. Now, a decent, honest, and ordinary person would never tolerate that. My Auntie Doris would never have tolerated that. She'd have said, you can stick your poached quail eggs and your black truffle shavings where the sun don't shine. Because yes, Ordinary people can be vulgar sometimes. Sometimes they're justified in being so. Sometimes being vulgar is more eloquent than eloquence. Which leads me on to the idea of being over-educated. We've never been so well-educated in our culture. That is, in a robotically functional way. Trained for a career. But being trained for a career and a place on Mortgage Street doesn't equate to something so simple is being truly literate, of knowing how to parse a sentence, for example, of knowing your pronouns from your past participles. Now, how many of you even know what parsing is? The analyzing of a sentence in terms of grammar. Now, I've met people with university degrees who want to be writers, who confess they don't know what a verb is. They sort of laugh and think ignorance of the very 
basics of language is an endearing feature, kind of cute. But it's like a carpenter not knowing a nail. It's stupid. Basic grammar, something that only a few decades ago was considered an ordinary, everyday piece of knowledge, a basic function of being able to read and write, well, nowadays seems kind of rarefied and exotic. And just for the record, just so you know I know, a verb expresses action and state of being in a sentence. Everyone thinks they're extraordinary, special, if only to themselves, and that's understandable. And as we stare out at the world from inside our skulls, we do have a singular and a unique perspective on the world. But the world makes demands on us to feel and look great and fantastic and physically fine-tuned from our cholesterol down to our pedicured toes. And I'm sure the desire to feel and look great was always there in people. Those who had the luxury, had the time, and had the money to look after their health and their personal grooming, keep themselves warm and well-fed, had the opportunity to believe in themselves, had the opportunity to extract a good life from the future. But many of our forebears were from the bottom of the class heap, whether in the UK or in the Middle East, Asia, Europe, mine were, my, my forebears were from Liverpool in England, from the east end of London and from the north of Ireland. And they grew up being told they weren't extraordinary. They were ordinary folk whom the better people patronized as reliable, and they bloody well were. They were the people you called upon to fix a cupboard door or to scrub your front step. They started out life with their expectations low, they started out sort of already disappointed, even before they'd faced any of life's big blows. But once they emigrated to the Antipodes and established themselves here, and they'd done okay, they'd got small businesses, got a bit of property, they started to do that thing we do to each other to make ourselves feel good and to feel important. They started to tell their offspring, like me, that they were special, that they were remarkable, that they were extraordinary, capable of anything. They told them they were being given every opportunity in life and were able to realize any dream in their hearts. They gave them a sense of entitlement. Like that horrible movie, Dead Poets Society, where the cheesily grinning Robin Williams character, who's a school teacher, tells his class of spoiled little schoolboys to seize the day, make your lives extraordinary. Well, you can seize the day if you want, but don't expect the day to like it. <laughs> Running around seizing the day gives you no entitlement to anything. It may even land you in trouble. A bloke I went to sc school with seized the day so much he ended up in prison. <laughs> the collar bomber up in Sydney, that's him. If you seize the day, don't be surprised if the day kicks you in the teeth. The more entitled you feel to things in life, the more airs you give yourself, the more life will most likely disappoint you. You might even end up feeling bitter. You might end up feeling guilt and shame for not measuring up. You might end up being called ordinary in the slangy sense of the word, the derogatory sense, but mild derogatory, you know, like uh, the weather's a bit ordinary today. Sherborne looks a bit ordinary, that sort of thing. It's insulting, but in a way, it's trying to be nice about it. Now, last year, in Massachusetts, in America, a real school teacher, not a movie school teacher, a real one, named David McCulloch, decided he'd do the right thing by his students and their parents and bravely inject some realism into their lives. He made a speech wherein he said the following, you are not special. He explained to them, in our unspoken but not so subtle Darwinian competition with one another, which springs, I think, from our fear of our own insignificance, a subset of our dread of mortality, we have, of late, to our detriment, come to love accolades more than genuine achievement. We have come to see them as the point 
and we're happy to compromise standards or ignore reality if we suspect that's the quickest way or only way to have something to pose with, to crow about, something with which to leverage ourselves up to a better spot on the social totem pole. Well, the New York Times, among other publications, picked up on the speech. Now, being a progressive media outlet, it didn't dismiss, dismiss Mr. McCulloch as un-American or a dispiriting influence on the young, as, say, Fox News might have. It didn't condemn him as a cultural heretic in a country that places positivism and achievement at the very center of its national soul. The New York Times rang around and obtained some thoughtful views on this speech from some of the nation's better thinkers, one of whom said the following. In this world, an ordinary life has become synonymous with a meaningless life. What a terrible thought, that a, an ordinary life should be considered meaningless. Well, I guess that's the price you pay in a secular society where everything you extract from life must come from within that time we spend between birth and death and nothing else. So when people had gods, they had meaning beyond this world. They had the prospect of immortality a whole different time frame to operate by. And therefore, no matter how bad their lives were, their time spent on this earth was never meaningless. They were preparing for an afterlife. And what are we preparing for? Having enough superannuation? Now, there's no doubt the United States has a big problem where ordinariness is concerned, and I hope we don't follow their example. A recent social media survey conducted by academics at the University of California in Los Angeles found that they've got a nation of kids whose priority in life is to be famous. That's the number one aim. 33% of 9 to 15 year old surveys said that being famous was either very important to them or just somewhat important to them. And you might say, well, that's just the Americans. Mm -mm. Same in, in the United Kingdom. A similar survey there found that 15 to 11 year olds listed sports star, pop star, or actor as their top three employment preferences. That's opposed to teacher, banker, and doctor 25 years ago. You wanna be famous? Try falling in love. Famous on a small scale to one person. That's pretty famous. That's enough for me. I feel sorry for the kids in those surveys. I really do. It's sad to think that pop stars, sports stars, and actors represent extraordinary achievement to them, to the point where they begin to entertain delusions of grandeur themselves. Now, hopefully, they'll grow out of it. Hopefully, they'll come across a Mr. McCulloch from Massachusetts, who one day will say to them, you are not special, you are ordinary. Value that in yourself. Now, it seems to me, if you must aspire to extraordinariness in life, at least aspire to the real thing. What is the real thing? Well, here's a small list for you. Just two names I think of when I think of extraordinary people. The first is a woman I know called Carol Perks. Now she's from Frankston. And she trained as a nurse, specialized in child and maternity care, and then 21 years ago, intrepid woman that she is, she decided to go to Laos and apply her skills there because she felt they were needed there more than here. And in Laos, the life expectancy of adults is barely over 60. In children under one year old, on average, 42 out of every 1,000 die, 70 out of every 1,000 in some districts. And that's opposed to four per 1,000 here. Poor hygiene, poor diet, primitive birthing practices, they were killing people. But Carol had to forgo every comfort she'd ever known. She lived in the jungle, in rat-infested hovels, always under the threatening gaze of the country's military regime. She didn't speak the language, and she had hardly any medicine at her disposal. Yet 21 years later, in the regions where she established her healthcare program, the death rate for infants dropped to 11 per thousand. 
When she arrived in Laos, 19% of the people had malaria. 21 years later, zero. Kids were stunted, now they're normal sized. And when I asked her how she could leave a comfortable life in Australia to go and live in squalor and toil and such difficult conditions, she didn't big note herself. She just shrugged and said, it's what I was trained to do. Now number two on my list was really number one and sort of so high up there, you can't really, up there. The most extraordinary human being, I think, in my lifetime is Nelson Mandela. I don't have to tell you about him except to say this. In 1990, when the apartheid regime in South Africa let him out of prison after 27 years, he could have ignited a firestorm of revenge. A bloody civil war that killed thousands, maybe millions. But he didn't do that. Instead, he calmly inspired his people to go the other way. He spoke deep into their souls and said, no, it's not a revolution we need. It's a reconciliation. And he just didn't have the gift of the gab in a charismatic way about him. He had the plain, pragmatic skills to make it happen, to play the politics to perfection. He is what the word extraordinary was invented for. Forget your pop stars, forget your sports stars, forget your actors. Now, a few of you are very likely extraordinary. Maybe. I don't know. I'm certainly not. Years ago, when I was more impressionable than I am today, more malleable, easy to influence, I had my tires pumped up by parents and teachers and lovers and telling me how good I was at things, reassuring me that I had the right look, I had the right brain, I had the world at my feet. And I believed them. I read all the books I could possibly fit into my eyeballs, the right books, serious ones, none of your entertaining, you know, unserious rubbish. For all that, you know, I realized a few years ago that I only got a fraction of the pleasure and excitement from reading those books as I simply did from stroking a horse's face or swimming in the wild surf or walking with the sunshine on my back on a crisp spring morning. I fear I've wasted years sitting inside reading extraordinary books when I should have been outside in the ordinary sunlight One of the people I wasted my time reading was George Bernard Shaw. And nobody pays much attention to his stuff anymore. You know, theatres don't put on his plays. They're too wordy and full of eccentric ideas, too sarcastic. But at the beginning of last century, he wrote a play called Man and Superman, which is a sort of upper class, left wing romantic comedy. And one of the absurdest flashes of insight in that play was that if you follow evolution, through to its national, natural conclusion, then all human beings will eventually be geniuses. What a scary notion that is. Imagine the clash of egos. Society would shut down. There'd be chaos at the supermarket because nobody was prepared to work as a checkout attendant. They'd all want to be prime minister. They'd all want to be boss. And then I'll tell you what would start happening. They'd all be so miserable. They'd start wishing they were ordinary. Like the good old days, they'd say. If only life was like the good old days when things were simpler. Then I'd tell you what they'd start doing. They'd start pretending to be ordinary. False ordinary, I call it. Like the rich and famous do now, those movie stars and those sports heroes that the kids in those surveys want to emulate. No matter how high their careers soar, they let the public know that underneath it all they're just an ordinary, regular kind of person. They value family more than fame and fortune, they say. A round of golf, a barbecue with friends. Gwyneth Paltrow and Cameron Diaz apparently like knitting. I'm sure they do. I don't doubt their sincerity in making that public for a second. But I know there's great PR in being seen as ordinary, of having been seen to have the common touch. Shakespeare knew this. 
He loved putting into his plays average, everyday folk who at first seemed, well, fools, really. But they were wiser than the wise and more contented. He wasn't dumbing his plays down, quite the opposite. He was wising them up. The grave diggers scene in Hamlet, for instance. Now, he may give some profound, if rather maudlin, poetry to the rather self-piteous Prince of Denmark to speak, to be or not to be, you know. But he brings the play down to earth, literally, in the grave diggers scene. They are not princes or aristocrats who build kingdoms and estates that last only a generation or two. The houses we make last till doomsday, they boast. A sort of revenge of the common man. Very high-minded of Shakespeare. Unfortunately, in our world, not very much is high-minded. Ours is a world of media swirling around our senses and of packaging the human experience for commercial gain. The ugliest and the crudest examples of which can be found, not surprisingly, in the daily news cycle. It's one thing to help celebrities boost their profiles by accentuating their ordinary side in photos and in interviews, but it's quite another to package fatal car accidents, murders, the deadly misfortunes that befall people by including in the reporting those tasteless cliches contrived to pluck a little pity in our hearts on cue. The victim was a mother of three. The victim was a father of two. Milking the tragedy for all it's worth, making the victim automatically appear to be decent and honest simply because they, because they had offspring. They, for all we know, they could have been the biggest bastards in the world. False ordinary. You've got to watch out for it. Now, here in Victoria, there's a shallow and parochial measurement for being ordinary. Barracking for the football team. Now, on the surface, it's kind of quaint. It gives everyone a common link, something to talk about, the footy without having to talk about anything substantial. But you soon work out that there's a sinister little edge to it. You're in trouble if you don't barrack. If you don't care about who wins this game or that grand final, there's a whiff of suspicion around you. You're not one of us. You're an outsider, not good enough. It's crazy, really, isn't it? But it's, but it's there. And so you start doing what I did years ago. You start faking it. You start pretending you're barrack, just to fit in. But I stopped because I didn't want to be that kind of ordinary, false ordinary. I didn't want to live a lie. Now, I've got to admit, I associate true ordinary with country life. And I know that's a bit silly. Earthy ordinary, I call it. But that's me. Farmers going about their paddocks, going about their business in paddocks, unobserved by anyone except cockatoos and rabbits. Not trying to stand out like those overdressed punces do on Chapel Street, like they're on a catwalk. I guess what I mean is that's my ideal, kind of my fantasy of being ordinary, my personal preference. I'd love to live like that, but I'm too restless. I got infected with the bug of entitlement when I was young, and paddocks just seemed too well, ordinary, a place to be. And I wish I could change, when I try, but I fail. But I know that being ordinary means different things to different people. Whatever social group or economic group you're in, that's gonna be your definition of ordinary. Now, I have a cousin who's deaf and dumb, when I was a kid, I yelled into his hearing aid, what's it like to be you? And he just kind of looked at me as if I was an idiot. Because to him, being deaf and dumb was his normal. It was his ordinary. These days, I think, there's a, I think of it as a sort of um, quasi-medical cult that's grown up around us, trying to persuade us that being normal 
is abnormal. A few years ago, I got a pamphlet through my letterbox that had on it a checklist of questions along the lines of, uh, do you have trouble sleeping? Well, yeah, always have. Do you worry about things and fidget? Yeah, who doesn't? Do you not want to get out of bed in the morning? <laughs> Every morning. And on it went like that, this list of questions. And I ticked, hell yes, for all the questions. All of them, hell yes. The pamphlet was from Beyond Blue. Trying to drum up business? I don't know. It said, if you answered these questions in such and such a way, you may be suffering from depression. Call this number. I showed it to a couple of neighbours. They ticked the questionnaire the same as I did. A couple of my friends too. We were all having a good day. <laughs> and suddenly we were made to feel kind of sick. And then I got angry. Come on, I said, don't do that. Don't pathologize life itself. The, old, the ordinary old frustrations of living, don't do that. How dare you be that cynical? Well, I got really angry. And what's that poem? by Bruce Dorr about the people from the southern states going up to the Gold Coast to uh, escape life's anxious illness, is how he put it. Well, now everywhere is the Gold Coast, it would seem. We're all looking to escape. Maybe it's a kind of first world problem. You expect more from life than life can possibly deliver, and then you realise that you're just an ordinary person and your life feels meaningless as a result, and so it must be the fault of an illness. My favourite Irishman is a master wordsmith called the late Patrick Kavanagh. And he was a real ace when it came to setting out irony. And he wrote a wee thing called Epic that began, I have lived in important places, times when great events were decided. And despite being called Epic and having those two grand opening lines, turns out, He's writing about two farmers having a barney over the fence about who owns a rood of rock separating their properties. Yet to them, it was their Battle of Waterloo. It meant everything in the world to them. And I often think of those lines. I have lived in important places, times when great events were decided, because I have not lived in important places. The great events being decided were happening in other places. In America, Middle East, Russia, South Africa, Northern Ireland, and they didn't involve me, and they didn't involve anyone I knew. Now, I'm very grateful not to have lived in so-called important places. It's a lot safer here. But I know there's something quite thrilling about those websites where you can hunt out your family tree. The Australian wing of Ancestry.com claims to have 13 million family trees currently on the go, 13 million. I've got friends obsessed by this stuff, trying to find an obscure genetic link back to an important place in time and in history, Gallipoli, the Battle of the Somme, perhaps to a king or a baron, a famous scientist or a rich industrialist, even a first fleet convict will do, you know, just something unusual and dramatic. Of course, it doesn't mean they're dissatisfied with their lives. There's something in all of us that wishes we could stand out just a bit among our friends, be a little elite, if only in our own minds. For when we die, we're a long time dead. And the truth is, the world will not remember us. Only a paltry few will have that honour. That's the reality. That's our fate. But please don't despair. That New York Times article I referred to earlier about my hero, Mr McCulloch, it must have been put together by a well-read reporter because it included this paragraph from George Eliot's novel, Middlemarch, a sort of celebration of the unremembered. It goes like this. The growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts and that things are not so ill between you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who live 
who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. Not bad, huh? Lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. I bet she knew how to parse a sentence. Now, I'll be honest, Middlemarch was a novel I never much liked when I studied it at school. I was probably too young for all that gravitas. I might have to go back and read it. Well, maybe not. Maybe I'll follow my own instincts and do something similar, simpler. Like go and stroke a horse's face. Or hold out for the spring to come and then take a long walk with the sun on my back. <laughs> 